Okay, sorry about that. God, I hate having to splice these recordings together. It's so annoying. Um, anyway, where we left off, thank you guys for bearing with me and returning here. I think we recollected most people. Um, so you have your handheld cracker, but I would say that probably the most efficient and the most popular method of doing nitrous is using a rooster, which is this thing. Whoops, looks like that. And I guess it's called a rooster because of the slight but not perfect resemblance. Um, so usually when you do this, and I'll show you how to crack it into a canister and everything, uh, nitrous only lasts for like a minute and a half to three minutes max, I would say. Like if it lasts more than three minutes, you're probably high on something else or doing a continuous quantity of it. So you come up really quickly on nitrous. Like you're supposed to hold it as long as possible. Um, yeah, if you use those little mini tubes, you run really serious risk of frostbite on your hands. The pressurized gas of nitrous oxide will give you frostbite. It will fucking hurt. And the more you use any metal container like a canister, like loading eight or nine whippets into it consecutively, please do not try and put more than two whippets at a time into these canisters. It cannot hold that much gas. If it's a big boy, it can hold two. If it's a small boy, it can hold one. Don't push it because if it pressurizes too much, it's fucking scary. Um, it's very, very cold. So you can do the nitrous right out of the rooster. You can also put it into a balloon. Um, if you're using a handheld cracker, you should never try and inhale it directly. You will get frostbite in your mouth. So always use a balloon in those situations. Um, oh no, I guess we can't watch someone do nitrous right now. Uh, yeah, be very careful. So generally nitrous produces kind of like a floaty, buzzy, hummy feeling. Sometimes you can get open eye visuals if you do a lot of it in a row. Sometimes you can get closed eye visuals, although it is most likely going to be in the form of like kind of an undulating grid forming over your vision and not like fully formed hallucinations. Um, depending on what kind of high you are, you can have really crazy hallucinogenic experiences on nitrous, especially if you mix it with other drugs. Nitrous is like a garnish for so many different substances, and it's pretty synergistic with a lot of different substances. Um, yes, I will stay after and show you how to clean out a cracker. Um, <sighs> that's a good comparison, Shark. Yeah, I would advise if you're gonna do nitrous, invest in getting the big rooster. Get a big canister, they're like 20 to $40. If you get a little one, it's 20. If you get a big one, it's 40. Just do it. Get a metal one if you can and put a sock around it. Otherwise the metal will freeze. It'll, there'll be like frost on it. So let it warm up before you use it between rounds. Um, now, a lot of the auditory hallucinations that can come from nitrous, uh, have been attempted to be replicated. Um, this is not supposed to be nitrous necessarily, but here's some spongle for any of you that are familiar. Oh, come on, come on. Auditory hallucinations are quite common on nitrous compared to other drugs. So um, depending on what you're on, like again, if you're on acid, for instance, you can get full blown auditory hallucinations. Like you are hearing stuff that is not there. But oftentimes auditory hallucinations on drugs just sound like one thing that is ding, 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 like extending, it's extract, it's pulling out, it's time stretching. Um, multiple hits of nitrous in a row. Oh man, there's so much to say about nitrous. Okay. Let me just give a breakdown of this. So the more you do in a row, like if you're doing a continual stream of nitrous, it will build up in your system differently than if you're like doing one hit, taking a bunch of oxygen in, coming down, doing another hit. If you are trying to do multiple balloons sequentially, then you will retain like a nitrous oxide analgesic effect for a little bit of time afterwards. Um, and, and this does compound the effects somewhat. Now, some people will inhale and exhale out of their balloon to pull more nitrous in because you don't fully metabolize it when you breathe it in the first time. So if you exhale it and then breathe it in again, you get some remaining nitrous and it can extend your stash from that single balloon. Um, the risk there is that you are at a higher likelihood of like 
the thing about oxygen deprivation with nitrous is you can't really actually truly deprive yourself of oxygen to an extent that would be life-threatening unless you are like covered like some people will put a bag over their head or a mask on that doesn't have oxygen and that can kill you easily but we'll come back to that in a minute um generally speaking it's it's pretty common practice to load a balloon with two or three chargers worth and then to just like continuously hit it or to breathe in and out of the balloon. If you're breathing in and out of the balloon, your ass had better sit down because you might fall. Now here is a description of uh, fishing out and fishing out is a term for when you basically anesthetize yourself. And um, yeah, basically anesthetize yourself on nitrous and this guy does it on purpose. Oh, yeah. Do not do this at home. There are so many harm reduction things that are not happening in this that should be happening. See if you can spot them all. I just did two balloons and then fish out. So now I'm gonna try and do three balloons and see if I fish out. He's standing, that's a good one. Standing by a table, it's even worse. But he's also. The bag's already leaving. All right, first one's taking effect. Alright, <laughs> <laughs> hey, the first one fucked me up more than the last one. Check them all. Okay, so within literally like eight seconds, he's up and walking again. Like that's how fast this drug is metabolized. Yeah, there, buddy. <laughs> and he's up. So here's the thing is that first off, that technique was terrible. If you take in a hit of nitrous and then you immediately exhale it, you're barely getting any of the, of the nitrous. Like you need to hold it to allow gas exchange to occur. Um, it does indeed also look like he might've been drinking. Losing your balance on nitrous is pretty common if you're doing like a heavy stream of it. Um, also his friends just like watching him fall to the ground, it, like actually it's fairly common to see at like festival medical tents to see people come in with like busted foreheads from when they hit their nitrous balloons too hard and passed out and hit stuff on the dance floor. That's like a really quite a common thing like trauma, like physical trauma from doing that. Now in medicine, um, Nitrous is commonly used to induce anesthesia. I'm sure that many of you have had a mask put on. Maybe as a child at the dentist's office, they put chapstick on the inside of it so it would smell nice. Um, it's also very common in pediatric dentist dentistry and like regular dentistry and also just like for children in general because it's a very mild way of knocking somebody out. Um, generally speaking, nitrous is a non-toxic substance unless you are doing it on a regular basis, especially if you're doing a lot of it. And I will explain why right now, immediately. So yeah, I know it's kind of cute. <laughs> unless. So the biggest issue with nitrous use a lot of people kind of like latch onto this idea of oxygen deprivation as being the biggest risk of doing nitrous. And while it is true that like over time, if you are intentionally trying to take in more nitrous than oxygen, your overall like blood quantity of oxygen will be lower than it should be. And you probably won't feel too good. But the biggest risk is actually B vitamin deficiency, um, specifically vitamin B12. And if you're not familiar with this and you do nitrous, you need to be. So B12 is an essential vitamin in the body. There's a reason that it's in so many supplements. In fact, if you supplement B12, it makes your piss turn bright radioactive Gatorade horse yellow. 
So when you do nitrous for like three or four days after doing nitrous, your body basically cannot properly metabolize vitamin B12. Now, if I remember correctly, the specific reason for that is that usually B vitamin needs to be moved from like level one to level two to level three of being broken down and metabolized. And it, if I remember correctly, and do not quote me on this, nitrous prevents it from being broken down from level two to level three, basically. So the gist of this is that it's not necessarily even the quantity of nitrous that you do. If you're doing it regularly, you are not allowing your body to reprocess B vitamin the way that it should be. And this is like, it, it seems like this might not be a big deal. Like if you're anything like me, you look at this and you're like, oh, supplementing, like oh, it's one vitamin, not a big deal. If you are vitamin B12 deficient, you can have very severe neuropathy, which is basically like a loss of feeling and sensation in your fingers and your toes and your extremities, muscle spasms and twitches, nerve pain. Like it's really no joke. B vitamin serious depletion is like a major health concern that is implicated in a ton of different things. Um, seizures, yeah, it, it's really important to be mindful of B12 depletion. If you are already vitamin B deficient, you probably should stay away from nitrous for the most part or do it only very sparingly. Um, in my opinion, it is better to do one binge session of nitrous a month or less than do like a small quantity of nitrous throughout the week, because then you're just like continuously pushing back your body's ability to process and metabolize B vitamins. And the problem is that B vitamins, as with all vitamins, aren't necessarily going to actually work and be effective unless you get a specific kind and administer it in a specific way that is bioavailable, that easily crosses the blood brain barrier, which is fancy speak for it works effectively and actually does its job in your body. A lot of supplements claim to do a lot of things, but in reality, the way that they're metabolized doesn't actually allow them to reach your bloodstream in the way that they should. Frostbite decal, yeah. And then there's frostbite, like don't touch the charger, be super careful, wear gloves. It will get super cold. The more that you do, get a rooster, invest in a rooster if you're doing nitrous. Um, Remember, at the end of this, we're going to talk about ketamine bladder cystitis supplements, and I'm going to show you how to clean a rooster. Uh, right, so don't cover your whole face with nitrous apparatuses. I guess the point of this is that nitrous isn't actually as completely risk-free as people think that it is. Now, originally in the 1700s, nitrous was discovered as this like super cool thing that could be inhaled out of silk bags at parties. And it became this like bit of ye old nitrous parties of the 1700s where people would go over to wealthy doctors houses and just do nitrous together. And that was how it started as a recreational substance as well as in medicine. Um, watching a friend do it and I thought it looked like her lips were turning blue briefly while holding it in was I just tricking myself into seeing that I would imagine that the level of hypoxia which is oxygen deprivation that you would need to get a blue tint would be such that she probably would not have been conscious or would have been noticeably on the edge if I had to guess that's my Can I chime in real quick Rachel yeah totally so I don't know if this is just me, but every time I do nitrous for about 30 seconds after my lips turn blue, huh. so I, I might just be person to person, but yeah, I, I know that happens to me. And I think it's just like momentary, like, you know, that's, less oxygen in the bloodstream. That's interesting. That's interesting. And it's also a good thing to note personally, the frequency at which you're doing it and pay attention to whether those things correlate. So if you take like three months off of doing nitrous and then you do like two balloons and you get blue tinted lips, then it's probably not that big of a deal or you could be B vitamin deficient. So be careful. Um, but if it takes a while for that to happen or you notice that you're doing nitrous fairly frequently, then it could be that there's a related issue. So if you're doing nitrous, everybody should be vitamin supplement, do some research on the most bioavailable B vitamin, um, B complex works or just B12. I recommend B complex because why not? Um, and B vitamin, you can really overdo it on B vitamin because it's excreted in your urine. So you can kind of just like pop B vitamins. It will make your pee look and smell crazy though. So be ready for that. It's really freaky when you're on acid and you've forgotten and you look down and you're just like, uh, vegetarians and vegans are at higher risk of B12 deficiencies. Thank you for sharing that. 
So nitrous is also used in cars and as a party thing. Um, there's like a ton of culture around nitrous, you know, there's like classical, uh, this is like breaky drum and bass, probably from late eighties, early nineties, I guess, maybe late nineties. Sound of nitrous. Hands go Thanos purple. Yeah, lack of, of blood flow to the extremities can be really scary. And getting pins and needles in your fingers and toes after doing nitrous can also be super scary and sometimes won't go away for a while. So don't get to that point. Um, I have known quite a few people that have actually been like addicted, psychologically dependent on nitrous is what I would say psychologically dependent on. Um, and it's, it's really no joke. In fact, nitrous, especially when combined with sleep deprivation is another dissociative. Like you can enter into a psychotic state if you are doing a ton of nitrous consistently, especially if you're combining it with the stuff, especially if you're not sleeping, like that is a totally possible thing. Oh my God, I have 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, Okay, so the question of whether nitrous kills brain cells. I'm sure that many of you have heard this theory that the little wah, wah, wah sound of being on nitrous is the sound of your brain cells popping, which reminds me of how when I was 10, I would see floaters in my eyes and tell my mom that I was seeing molecules in the air. So don't believe that. That's not actually how that works. Unless you are intentionally depriving yourself of oxygen, you are not going to kill your brain cells. If you are depriving yourself of oxygen, you can have brain damage for four to five minutes of lack of oxygen. That's when that starts. So you're really kind of like in the danger zone when the four minute mark hits. Um, and, and obviously you should get medical attention if you just like have no oxygen whatsoever for a period of time. Uh, yes, vasoconstriction from other substances like stimulants, for instance, or anything that will constrict your blood vessels will reduce blood flow to your extremities, which can make this more risky. Myth busted. Uh, this is autograde nitrous. It is not meant for human consumption. The number of crusty raves that I have been to with dudes in Jenko jorts selling nitrous that is autograde is frightening. And some people will just slap a filter on it, which is better than nothing, I suppose. Um, but this, this contains a lot of industrial lubricants. You don't want to do autograde nitrous. If it seems too easy, if it looks like it's auto and not medical grade in the tank, then don't do it. Like it's not the same as food or medical grade nitrous. And then there's nitric oxide. If you can find this easily online, don't be fooled and buy it. It will kill you. Just like, don't do that. Let's talk about PCP. One of the most heavily stigmatized drugs in the fucking universe. Um, gas mask filters used to filter autonos. So like there's some debate about whether or not filters are effective on autograde nitrous. My personal sentiment is that you just shouldn't do it, honestly. Um, you can, like I said, you can use filters. I don't know the specific kind of filter that you need to use, but again, the kind of filter is important to filter particular sizes of particulates and gas particles. Like you want to be very diligent in your research and I, I don't have the answer for that. So PCP, oh, this is a very controversial one that I'm excited to share information about today. Standard dose of PCP is three to eight milligrams. That's a couple of grains of sand. That's a really small quantity of any substance. It's also known as dry, or I'm sorry, dust or sherm. Um, wet angel dust was more popular in the 80s. Embalming fluid for the cheeky among us. And being high on PCP is frequently referred to as being stuck or wet. I personally think that this is one of the most unique and hilarious collections of terminology about any drug. Like who was like, oh yeah, bro, I wanna get stuck and wet today on this dust. It doesn't sound particularly sexy, but maybe that's just, maybe I'm biased, I don't know. Now, usually the reason that you would dip in liquid as opposed to powder is because a four to eight milligram dose is really tiny. It's kind of a similar reason why you would want to dilute your LSD in liquid is because then you can do volumetric dosing. You put a certain amount of material in a certain amount of liquid. And based on that, you can know, okay, there's approximately this much in this much liquid. With PCP, it's usually uh, not that precise. And I would say that it's much more common to find liquid than it is to find powder especially because liquid is way easier to dip a cigarette or a joint into and then you bring it with you into a party or something and you don't have to worry about having a baggie of powder and doing tiny little bumps. 
Um, I don't know how many milligrams are commonly bought at one time because I'm only really familiar with buying the individual dips. Um, that's just me though. Now, it should be noted that PCP has a very harsh chemically taste and smoke smell. So there's a big, I'm gonna stay after and give a little speech about fentanyl, PCP, and synthetics, because these are all interrelated. If you guys have seen the Dance Safe Instagram story yesterday, you will have seen all of this information very recently. Thank you, Fishy says, most people buy a quarter to a full gram at a time. That's really good to know, thank you. I don't even know what the street price for PCP is right now because it's really uncommon. It's one of those drugs where you have to run in the circle that likes it and has it. Um, it's become less popular. It was a kind of a regional thing in New York for a while, in New York City in particular. But I think that in the past couple of years, it's really dropped off in popularity because it was a little bit more unpredictable than other dissociatives. Now, when you smoke PCP, the effects are about four to six hours long. If you eat it, the come up will be a lot longer, which extends the overall duration of the experience. Um, PCP is a strange, strange little bird, particularly because it acts on acetylcholine. And this is not a neurotransmitter that we're going to talk about very much, but acetylcholine is involved in muscle control. And it basically, if you suppress the activity of acetylcholine, you're going to suppress muscle control. So one of the interesting hallmarks of PCP is that it is an acetylcholine antagonist. I actually don't know what its specific mechanism of action is. It might be an antagonist. Um, I'm not positive, so I'm not going to say. But PCP is, to a minor extent, a serotonin agonist. It is a dopamine reuptake inhibitor, so it prevents dopamine from getting sucked back up and recycled. More bang for your buck. Um, it also acts as an acetylcholine reduction agent, the specific mechanism of which I do not remember, to be honest, and a glutamate antagonist, a hallmark of dissociatives. It reduces communication between your brain and your body, which makes you more prone to doing things that might uh, be a little bit like floaty or weird. And it's also an opioid agonist, opioid receptor agonist. Specifically, I think has affinity for the mu opioid receptor in particular. Um, so this is kind of a funky set of things, right? We're looking at a lot of neurotransmitters that are impacted by PCP. And one of the interesting things about this is that PCP is known for being considerably more stimulating than other dissociatives to the point of mania in a lot of cases. Um, yes, there is some kappa opioid activity at high doses. I, I believe that all three of the major, neurotran or major opioid receptors are activated by PCP to varying degrees, but I'm not positive. For sure the mu receptor, I think also the kappa receptor, I'm not sure about anything else. Um, inhibitor and nicotinic, yeah, yeah. So the big question that I get asked all the time is like, what is, what is PCP actually like? You know, we hear so much about what it is and how dangerous it is and how it makes you eat babies and shit, but like, what does it feel like? And the answer is weird. And all dissociatives feel weird, dude. Like I can't even describe to you what dissociatives as a class feel like because it's fucking strange as hell. Like dissociatives basically make you take in information wrong. <laughs> They skew how you process your environment. And in some cases, this can be euphoric and very calming. Um, in other cases, it can just be e extremely confusing and sedating. Um, feels like ketamine without the couch lock. Yeah, so PCP is a lot more stimulating. It will not make you whole in the same way that ketamine will. And it's a lot less psychedelic in that way as well. Um, one of the major things about PCP and I need to finish this lecture, so I'm just going to go over probably by 15 minutes tonight. I'm sorry for those of you that have to go, but like, I just need to get on schedule here. So one of the major things about PCP is that it reduces your ability to recognize people, places, things, objects, nouns, basically. Um, and this is kind of a funky one because there are a couple of Arrowwood reports, for instance, of people that picked up a magazine with a goldfish on the front of it and just stared at it for a minute being like, what is is that like I don't know what that thing is and 20 minutes later it was like oh it's a fish oh fish has a definition that I know that I understand and then there's also this chat is just always in the way 
um, a sense of like calm and peace and apathy. Apathy is a really big thing. Apathy is an absence of feeling emotion about stuff. There's like a lack of emotional reactivity to things a lot of the time, but not all the time. And then there could also be very intense hallucinations and repetitions. PCP is huge on time stretching. It can feel like hours are days or lifetimes. Um, a single thought loop can get stretched out and twisted and warped into a, a larger thought loop. And many people actually have a very strong sense of serenity while this is happening, like a calmness. Um, now, another really interesting thing about PCP is that unlike a lot of other dissociatives, it makes music sound super weird. <laughs> and that's not always very attractive to people, but oftentimes on PCP, you'll put on what would otherwise be a nice song. And instead of being it being enhanced, which is kind of like a typical effect of many drugs is music enhancement. It just sounds kind of like strange. And this falls under the category of not being able to fully like process sensory information. Then there's also a major component of amnesia with PCP memory loss, acute, um, usually acute memory loss, but one of the major things with like constant and chronic PCP use is memory issues. And that's like a hallmark of dissociatives as well because they're involved in memory and learning disruption basically. Um, it, there's a very metallic feeling like a cold metally body high and smoke flavor. And this is particularly pertinent to the, the issue of acetylcholine. There's a lot of thought required for moving. It's not as simple as like, I'm gonna raise my hand. It's like, there is a thing attached to me and I would like it to go upwards and upwards means that it is that way. So I'm going to do this, which can make movement very slow, very weird and intentional. Now in emergency rooms, particularly when PCP was becoming more popular in the 90s, um, this acronym Red Danes became popularized. And this stood for rage, erythema or red skin, dilated pupils, delusion, amnesia, nystagmus and excitation. Um, so nystagmus, again, is eye wiggles, right? This, the general profile here is of someone who is agitated and confused. That's the gist of it, is that confused agitation and sometimes psychosis are not super uncommon um, with people that are having a difficult experience with PCP. However, the propensity for having a difficult experience on PCP isn't quite as high as the media says that it is. Compared to other drugs and dissociatives, it is higher. Like PCP is a less predictable substance. However, it's definitely a more contextual drug than a lot of other dissociatives. What I'm saying is if you have a predisposition to manic or psychotic disorders, um, I'm sorry, to mood disorders or psychotic disorders, or if you have a history of like feeling very anxious or agitated, or if you're currently experiencing something traumatic or you're currently really angry, these things could all be amplified. So doing PCP, I would say, is very much dependent on set and setting in a way that a lot of other dissociatives are not. Okay. Now, um, Experiencing seizures on PCP is also something that is a little bit more common because of the stimulating effects of it. Um, we're almost done, guys, don't worry. Uh, psychosis and mania, again, and like psychotic disorders are more likely to have their effects exacerbated by PCP than other dissociatives, anecdotally speaking. It's just not as popular of a substance because it is super finicky. So one of the issues with it is if you're smoking a joint that's been dipped, then one hit of that joint might get you perfect one night and might be super uncomfortable another night because the dosing is really inexact. Um, this also has kind of a little bit of a, a fiendier component to it compared to other dissociatives a lot of the time. And there is some speculation that the dopamine agonism effect, I'm sorry, the dopamine reuptake inhibition effect here is possibly, yeah, I've seen that before, that's funny, um, is possibly partially responsible for the increased incidence of things like psychosis. It's all speculation. Um, right, so we have all these people that are experiencing the PCP after effects and, and to note a lot of people, well, not, not everyone, but some people get like pretty pronounced hangovers after doing large doses of PCP, like headaches and feeling kind of foggy. So people would come out of surgery and be like, wow, I'm super fucking high. And then Dr. Mann said, okay, we're going to swap out for ketamine. That's cool, but uh, we're going to keep using PCP on our animals forever because they, we don't care if they have like crazy dissociative experiences as they come out of surgery. And then ravers were like, don't worry, guys, we'll take care of it. So they came in and picked up the slack and scooped up some PCP and started using it in the 80s more frequently, but it's still not that popularized. 
then there was this like really interesting surge of terror around PCP in the 80s that was largely fueled by um, Big Lurch. Some of you might be familiar with Big Lurch who killed and ate his roommate while he was under the influence of PCP. Um, now this was a media sensation. It was a firestorm because people were like, oh my God, zombie drug and we have proof this time. He ate his roommate. And then meanwhile, there was one guy that was a member of the Wu-Tang Clan, I think, that cut off his own dick. Um, so the, those things, Hamilton of, of Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia actually interviewed him and it was really entertaining. But PCP gained notoriety especially as being a drug of choice for black men in America, which led to Rodney King. Now, I hope that all of you are familiar at least with the name Rodney King. In the 80s, he was um, pulled over and brutally beaten by police who were saying basically, he, we think he's under the influence of PCP. Now, it doesn't matter whether or not he was under the influence of PCP, first of all. It doesn't fucking matter. He should not have been beaten. Um, but second of all, this demonstrated a really particular way that police brutality feeds off of specific stereotypes around drugs. It gives an immediate excuse to profile and commit violence against people that you want to subdue. Enter George Floyd, who was accused of being under the influence of insert drug here. So this is a really clear immediate example of how something like stigmatizing PCP, which for many people is like a very beloved substance that is comparable to ketamine for them. Um, yeah, but <laughs> I have a lot to say about the PCP. That's not to say that PCP is risk-free at all. It's definitely not. It does have a higher baseline risk profile than a lot of other dissociatives, undoubtedly, undeniably. You need to be very cautious when using PCP, but it's not this devil drug like it is made out to be. So people like Mac Miller have written about angel dust, about PCP. There's a lot of culture around this. Almost done, almost done, I know I'm late, sorry. Oh, you all have stuck around, right on, that's awesome. Um, it is not actually a thing for people to cannibalize each other under the influence of PCP. In fact, most of the time, the overt aggression that is reported uh, for PCP is like a very rare effect. You know, like many substances can cause aggression if a person is having a really difficult time on that drug. In the case of PCP and other dissociatives, most of the time, someone would just be fucking confused. And sometimes that confu confusion can turn into like fear and self-protection. And that's what often is happening in these situations is that something is like the wires are getting crossed, someone is afraid, someone needs to defend themselves. And it's not always that way, but that is often the case. Um, I have heard very long stories of people that I know who experienced a bout of, of PCP induced psychosis who like punched their friend at a rave and then like deeply regretted it. You know, stuff happens on various substances, but you're not going to eat people on PCP. Most of the time, people just get kind of like apathetic and confused as opposed to aggressive. So close to being done, guys. Um, ketamine is very common in human and veterinary medicine. Using it frequently can cause bladder damage. I recommend cutting down on use to be no more than once a month at the very most. Um, and it also can be very sneaky. Using ketamine on a regular basis for recreational purposes is a really quick ticket to developing a problematic relationship with it. I have seen a lot of people go down the ketamine rabbit hole by not taking it seriously. As soon as you have that feeling of, maybe I shouldn't do this for a while, and your brain goes, that's not going to work. That's when you check in. I've said that before, but like, be careful with ketamine, for real. Um, same with nitrous. It's very popular in nightlife, often used in dentistry. Vitamin B deficiency is a serious risk. Cut down on your use if you're using it more than like every couple of weeks, I would say. And then um, PCP, be mindful of mental health concerns. Set up your set and setting really mindfully here. Be very careful about your dosing. Have a trip sitter with PCP. Yeah. 
Uh, harm reduction for dissociatives. Please sit down when you do nitrous, lest you anesthetize yourself and fall over and hit your head. Please make sure that you're taking B vitamins, preferably of nice bioavailable one, before you do a session and space out your sessions so that you're not constantly depleting your B vitamin store. Make sure that you are inhaling oxygen as well as nitrous oxide. If you're going in and out of a, of a balloon, give yourself a few minutes to breathe in regular oxygen before hitting it again. Um, make sure to always do a risk assessment profile about manic, uh, manic tendencies and psychotic tendencies. Um, depressants do not play well with dissociatives. Having spins and possibly puking in your mouth and choking on it sucks. It's not great. I don't recommend it at all. It's actually very not fun. PCP also just like doesn't mix well in general with stuff, honestly. Like even something like weed. Weed has a really, really high rate of inducing acute psychosis, more than most other substances, if not all other recreational substances, because it's frequently used all the time. So be super careful about that. Um, mixing with stimulants can be way overstimulating and induce mania. Mixing with hallucinogens can be way confusing and induce psychosis. And this is a very broad brush stroke. You know, it's all con contextual. Just be careful. Um, and then be mindful of the compulsive redosing nature of PCP and the fact that you should start with one, maybe two hits of any given dip and don't do more than that until you've fully come up. Otherwise you could be seriously taken off guard. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep this recording on and stick around for a couple of additional things. If you guys want to bounce, that's the bulk of it. And thank you for sticking around for this. Um, I'm going to, there were three things to talk about ketamine bladder cystitis supplements. Thank you for reminding me, Jackson. Um, show you how to clean a rooster properly. And uh, what was the last thing I was going to say? Does anyone remember? Oh no. Cloth filter. Yes. I will tell you about filters. Okay, ketamine bladder toxicity. There is no sure way, no perfect flawless way of preventing ketamine bladder toxicity that we know of right now. Um, however, there are some leads. One of those leads is green tea extract, um, EGCG. Now, this is, I, I forget what you have to combine it with to make it bioavailable. There's some combination. If you just search it on Reddit, I'm sure that someone's posted about it so far. Um, but drinking green tea before doing ketamine or taking EGCG supplements with, I forget what the other thing is. I wish someone in here knew. That combination has been shown to potentially have bladder protective effects. Potentially. It's one of those things where it's probably not going to hurt to do it, but it doesn't guarantee you shit and it will caffeinate you a little bit. So prepare for that. Um, I believe that the other thing that's been implicated in protective uh, bladder protection is NAC, uh, which is this stuff, N-acetylcysteine. Yeah. So uh, I'm not positive on that one. I'll have to do some fact checking on it, but it's a good lead for those of you that are interested. Um, yeah, so if you're going to be doing ketamine, I highly recommend checking out a supplement regimen. It will not guarantee protect you from anything. Now, let me show you how to do a rooster clean real quick. Surprise, here it is. Ta -da. My baker. So unscrew the top of your hot hot pink rooster and when you look inside of it you might find yeah this is a really cute one <laughs> travel size now this one has been recently cleaned so there's nothing really to see in here um what i recommend doing though let me see if there's any any gunk in the top of this one you should look both on the inside of the rooster itself, but also on the inside of the top. And you will probably find that there are like little specks of black and other industrial lubricants in there, or just that what I recommend doing is um, grabbing a toothbrush and a paper towel, folding the paper towel and wrapping around the toothbrush with a rubber band, like really tightly, and then sticking it inside and just scrubbing away on the inside of it to give yourself a good idea of how much goop is on the inside of your rooster. Um, you can 
put it in, I believe that many of these are dishwasher safe, but you should check what kind they are first because some coatings might not play well with that hot of water. Otherwise, wash it out with soap and water, but you better be super thorough about rinsing the soap out. Otherwise your nitrous will taste like soap for a while. Um, be mindful of that. I think one of you actually told me that your rooster tasted like soap for a bit after you cleaned it. So that sucks, I'm sorry. Um, you should also clean out the nozzle. Now, when it comes to making a filter, there's a really interesting Arrowid article from like a decade ago that did a test. And you guys might be like really disgusted by what you find inside of a rooster. You might be like, oh, there's nothing here. And most likely you'll find kind of a thin yellow oily residue on the inside of it, if anything. Um, usually different brands will have like a different level of goop that they leave behind and one rooster might hold it differently than another. So, oh yeah. So how you would do it is you take your charger, pop it into this thing upside down stick it on top of there, screw it down until it, and you hear all the nitrous leaking inside of it. And then wait until that sound is stopped before unscrewing it. Otherwise you get like a spurt of cold nitrous air on your hand. So be careful of that, especially if it's cold. Um, and then you, so to make a filter, it's super, super easy. Um, I don't know if I have the right materials on me, but you can literally just use like, your shirt and put it over it if you need to, if that's all that you have, because it's cotton. Ideally, you would take some kind of cotton filter, either like a piece of cloth, like three layers of a piece of cloth that you've cut and then wrap it around the top right here and uh, use a rubber band to secure it. So I don't have that av available immediately on me. You can probably find a higher quality filters at a hardware store or something. You just wanna make sure that they're not uh, made of like fiberglass or something that is not great for you to inhale through. Um, so cotton is probably, yeah, just on the mouthpiece, just right here. You just like wrap it over, wrap the rubber band around and secure it. So it looks like a little tuft and then you can just go right through it. Cheesecloth might work. Um, yeah, the cotton should be fine. I think it's tight knit enough, kind of like your masks, which you are all wearing, right? Um, so you could probably even do that. Honestly, if you have a mask, you could just like put your mask over like really Rona doing us in providing everyone with free filters for their roosters. That's so kind of her. So you just put your mask over, secure it with a rubber band. And that's like pretty much it. Or you could, yeah, like you said, cut up an old N95. Um, and this is a great, actually, this might be a great gift. That's a good idea, Shark, to bring to raves and festivals when the time comes is like a DIY rooster filter and just give it out to people and be like, here's a rubber band. Here's a little note that says what you should do with it. That's so sweet. Prevent people from getting black specks of industrial lubricant and metal pieces inside of their lungs. That's so nice. Um, inhaling from a rooster is not actually... I don't think that there's any particular danger from inhaling from a rooster. It's when you're inhaling from a cracker, like a handheld cracker where it's right next to your face. Don't do that. That will hurt so much. But if you're inhaling just from this thing, the gas will have time to warm up as it's in this container. You'll feel the frost form on the outside of it. Um, if you would prefer, you can also do it out of a balloon. I know a lot of people just prefer doing it out of a balloon in the first place. Um, it will not filter out any nitrous. The particles are small to get through. Uh, okay. Was that everything? Oh yeah. In terms of the lubricants and whipped cream, usually you're not cracking a hundred whippets into your whipped cream. So presumably, I don't know what's actually in these lubricants. I'm not sure, but I've definitely wiped little specks of metal out of the, the rooster before. And that's the scary bit. You do not want specks of metal in your lungs. The lubricant is probably food safe. Um, but generally speaking, I would say that it's, it's probably not super toxic, but the quantity of nitrous that you would be cycling through in a recreational session is much higher than you would use to actually make whipped cream officer, I swear. Uh, yeah, any further questions right now? Cool. Okay, guys, stop this recording.